Today is July 29th, 2024. My guest is physician Adam Seafew, professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. His blog on Substack is Sensible Medicine. This is his third appearance on the program. He was last here in July of 2019 talking about the case for being a medical conservative. Adam, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thank you so much, Russ. It's great to be here. Our topic for today is the day-to-day life of being a doctor. Uh, we're going to use some of the essays you've written at your blog, Sensible Medicine, that are really quite wonderful, that reveal the challenges and rewards of the career you've chosen. Um, let, let's start with uh, the Declaration of Geneva, <laughs> uh, something I had never heard of. Uh, I, I don't. You don't mention how old it is. Um, yeah. What is it? Right. I'm afraid I don't know. It, it was. Okay. It, it was interesting. I um, I wrote this essay thinking about a pledge that I assume is part of what doctors take or is part of our career, which is that we treat all of our patients equally. Um, and I assumed it was in the Hippocratic Oath. And so I ended up taking this deep dive into the Hippocratic Oath, the original, which has become quite politically incorrect, and all the new versions of the Hippocratic Oath. And that pledge doesn't appear anywhere in the Hippocratic Oath. And so I finally found this Declaration of Geneva, which has been adopted by, I think, about half the medical students as their at medical schools as their pledge that their graduates take. And um, that declaration does, in fact, include that you will take care of your patients irrespective of you know, wealth, creed, color, sexual orientation, anything else. And so I was like, okay, I found it. I'm doing an essay about this. <laughs> And why why did you find that interesting? Well, I found it interesting because I I really do think, you know, it's an assumption, right? And it's something that I think doctors pride themselves in, right? That um, we have to take care of patients who we like. We have to take care of patients we don't like. We have to take care of patients who might talk politics in the room and we might find out that we agree with them or desperately disagree with them. Um, but I think we all take pride in the fact that it doesn't matter, you know, and it's in fact one of the wonderful things about the career is that we come to work and we talk to and we work closely with people who we might not have anything else to do with in our entire life. Um, so not only does it feel good to do, it actually makes, I don't know, sort of my life more enriching, I think. You tell the well-known story of Ronald Reagan after he was uh, shot in Washington, D.C., being rushed to the emergency room. And I think, was it on his way in that he said this? Yeah. Or was it I, once he got on the table? I think, I think it was once he got on the table. Right. I think it was when, when he got onto the table, he said to the you know team of doctors, I hope you're all Republicans. Um, and the surgeon, who was in fact a Democrat, said, President Reagan, we are all Republicans today. Um, which I thought was a wonderful response. I hope, I hope the story is true. <laughs> it sounds apocryphal, but it's yeah. a great story. <laughs> Although I find the uh, you know Reagan was known for his sense of humor yes. and his interest in in jokes, but that to me, um, I recognize myself in that joke. Not that I worry that my doctors have a different political orientation from mine or ideological orientation, but that under great stress we often turn to humor. And I'm sure you, as a doctor see that in some patients, but not others, I assume. Absolutely. And I also think it speaks to the importance of the role of the patient in the, you know, doctor-patient relationship um, is that, you know, the, the patient has a lot of power to manage how those visits go, right? And I think Ronald Reagan, as the great communicator, um, was really using it at that point, right? Like, <laughs> here's a way to put everybody at ease, um, take a little bit out of the stress of the situation, get people on my side. It's kind of brilliant, actually. Um, well, and, uh, of course, he was subtly reminding people of the Declaration of Geneva <laughs> that in case they were Democrats, they shouldn't <laughs> behave like them if, if they didn't <laughs> care for his, his positions on various issues. Let me pull out the Declaration of Geneva, which I happen to carry in my breast pocket at every time. Yeah. Now, uh, interestingly, in that essay, you remark that 
many of your uh, many of your patients treat you poorly. Uh, I think that's surprising uh, to most of us. I, at least it is to me. I, you know, I try to treat my doctors well for very self-interested reasons, but also, right. you know, as a form of normal respect to someone. Um, yeah. how, why do people treat you poorly? Do you think? Yeah, well, I would say it's certainly not many of my patients. It is a very, very small minority. Um, and I think, you know, people bring into the doctor's office the way that they manage people in the rest of their lives, right? Um, most of my patients, I think, um, you know, feel, I don't know, in, entitled to good care, expect good care, expect sort of an equal collegial relationship with me, Um and that's very easy for me. I think that's very easy for the patients. Most of us fall in naturally to that. Um, there are also people who kind of come to the doctor's office um, feeling like they're going to be, I don't know, disrespected, disenfranchised the way they are in the rest of their life. Um, and they sort of manage the doctor often in ways that they manage everything else. Um, very often, interestingly, with the doctors, that's to be sort of overly appreciative and overly thankful, right? And it comes off being very nice until you sort of analyze where this is coming from. And it's kind of sad that, oh, my God, this is what this person needs to do to just sort of get what they deserve. Um, there are people who, I, you know, I call them the um, the sort of masters of the universe, right? The people who are used to bullying people and getting everything they expect in, in every part of their life. Um, sort of come into the doctor's office in exactly the same way. Um, and then there are people who I think just don't recognize that there's a benefit to a rich or at least equal or pleasant relationship with the physician um, and almost look at the doctor as they would, you know, somebody else who's providing services services to them in other parts of life, right? Um there's a quote that I don't know who it's from that, you know, you can you can judge people by the way they treat, you know, bank tellers, wait staff, things like that. Um, and there are those people who who treat, you know, those service workers terribly and they then treat their doctors terribly. And it's always interesting to me because I'm like, hmm, I'm going to do my best to take care of you like I would everybody else. But this doesn't help you a whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you making it so hard? I, um you suggest in the piece, uh, which is quite thoughtful, that you try to treat all your patients the same, but you recognize that there are conditions and situations and interactions that make it difficult, this being one of them, an abusive patient, say. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you actually try to you view that as a challenge, uh, and, and they may even get better treatment than others, but you also <laughs> talk about the human uh, side of the doctor-patient relationship that that you connect to some of your patients more uh, naturally, yep. and then um, it affects your your treatment of them in certain ways that that are that's quite it was a little bit surprising to me. So talk about that. Right, I I, I this is a challenge, and I find this difficult. Um, and I think on my best days in the office when I'm mindful, I recognize this and work at it. At other times, I think I probably fall short on this. Um, but there are people, you know, very often people who have similar backgrounds, you know, similar life, who you immediately connect with, right? And it's very easy. And not only is there the doctor-patient relationship, but there's something else added to it. Um, I don't know if this improves the care they get, but I can only imagine that it makes them more comfortable with you, right? This seems like a peer immediately. And then there are people who are, you know, from very different backgrounds, um, maybe backgrounds who are not even the people from different backgrounds who I'm used to caring for, that although they're expecting me to care, be a caring physician, and I'm going to be that, and I expect them to be, you know, a patient I can work with, and, you know, I'm going to do that, um, there's still a little bit of a separation between us, right? Um, and it may make them hold back, not tell me things they should. Um, I might not understand things about their life. It may just take a little bit more work for me to understand where they're coming from, what their sort of social norms are, what their behaviors around medications are. 
And, you know, maybe this is an argument for our continued effort to really, like, diversify our field. Um, but I think most importantly, it's just something to recognize, you know, as we care for the kind of diversity of patients that we all do. Yeah, I, I have doctors in my life who I feel that peer kind of similar background and so on. None of them take care of me for money. <laughs> They're all my friends who I get free medical advice from. <laughs> the doctors that I pay or who are paid by my insurance or the state um, are not good at establishing that rapport or maybe I'm not good at accepting it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never felt like a peer yeah. uh, to, a, to a doctor, a caretaking doctor that I'm interacting with. I have a long-standing joke on Econ Talk that I got from a family friend, Paul Kernackley, and that when he, he had a PhD in anthropology, when people would say, are you a doctor? He'd say, yes, but not the kind that helps people. <laughs> so I am a doctor. I am a PhD. I am not the kind that helps people. But that uh, degree has never helped me establish a rapport with the doctors who've treated me. In fact, I, many, many doctors who I've interacted with struggle with those kind of interpersonal skills. Yeah. The friends I have, I bet they're good at it with other people, not just me. I bet they're even good right, at right, paying right. patients. So I think it's an art on the part of the the caretaker. And um, I'm curious if if you think about that when you're sitting with someone who often is partially clothed, struggling with perhaps a, a serious traumatic life event. Right. Uh, do you have techniques or tricks or habits that help them be put at ease to share things they would that would be helpful to them, but otherwise they might keep to themselves. Sure. Um, I think those are all great points. Uh, um, so I do, and I think that it's something that we do our best to train our, you know, young physicians, trainees in, right? That ability to to be empathic, to meet people where they are, uh, to put them at ease in, in, as you say, which is just, by definition, you know, an uncomfortable experience, right? Sure. It's one of the few places that you go around in the world that you go to by choice, right? If you're going to the doctor's office and not the emergency room, where you're going to be powerless, you're not you know, in the end, you're not really in control of your illness and your body. Certainly we can all, you know, live good lives, but in the end, something's going to get us no matter what we do. Um, and it's so important to be able to kind of support the patient during that um, time, make them feel comfortable, um, make them be able to open up to you, feel like they have you in their corner for support. Um, while you were talking about it, it, it made me think of, of, of something um, that I think I struggle with most is that although I feel like I have control of how the patient feels about the relationship in the room, right? I can make them feel more comfortable. I can make them feel supported. Um, when they leave the room, um, what the patient brings to the relationship in which I don't have that much control of does actually affect how they interact with me, right? Um, the people who are maybe closer to me, you know, as peers, um, those people, there's so much less of a barrier to access me. And there's so many ways to access your doctor these days, right? Whether it's a phone call, an email, a text, you know, the electronic medical record sort of uh, communication devices. Um, most of those people have absolutely no qualms about saying, huh. I got a question, you know, I'm going to call my doctor about this. While the people who are a little bit more further afield and maybe still hold their doctors with, I don't know, some level of, you know, respect, right? Um, those people are often so hesitant to, to sort of reach out, even in the ways that are completely appropriate and expected. And we'll say, ah, you know, I'll wait until the next appointment. Um, and often suffer for that. Um, certainly, you know, I got to take some responsibility, right? There's something I haven't done to make them feel empowered to be able to to break through that. And maybe this is one of those those times that you have to think more about equity than equality, right? Those people need more help um, um, to get that that adequate care that they're supposed to have. But boy, this is a challenge. And when it's a day with you know twelve patients and you're exhausted by the end of your clinic and are just sort of dying to get home, um, it's just sometimes an effort that's hard to expend. I just want to say something on the side about this question of respect, or I'd say even more um, 
I, I would guess that most patients respect their doctors. They they may not revere them the way they did in older older times. Mm. And yet, despite the loss of expertise, respect for expertise and, and respect for the elites that, that is permeating, I think, America and the West in all kinds of ways, everybody knows how hard it is to, go, to get into medical school and to survive it. Everyone knows that you know an immense amount that I don't know. And then there's this third thing that I want to know if you feel it from patients. It's a sort of, it's a combination of idol worship and superstition. <laughs> uh, it's basically, it, it's almost as if uh, there'd be a window. I wouldn't see you. I would just slip my symptoms under the, in the, in the opening of the mail, the mail slot there. And, and a response would come back, you're fine. And and so often we turn, I think, in those emails and texts, or in, in sometimes you know personal communication, face to face, we want to be reassured. And unless you're an economist and you spent too much time listening to econ or a listener to econ talk, you're going to accept what a doctor tells you in a way that is so different from any other service experience in your daily life. And I see it all the time because I am an economist and I've heard every episode of Econ Talk. <laughs> so when people tell me, oh, the doctor said I should do this task, I'm thinking, no, 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 no. Don't do that test. No, no, no. You're not going to learn anything from it. It's not going to change anything. Please don't do it. There's only downside risk. And then I just I usually no. don't say that because they, they have this um, almost – a divine respect for a doctor as somehow immortal, in, in, non-human in a in a godly way. Right, <laughs> Russ. There is so much in what you just said. I think I could talk about this forever. Um, you know, a few things stand out. First, the the difference between reverence and respect. Uh, you know, deserves an essay in itself. Um, I think probably. You know, a little bit of reverence is good, um, just because you know that's what the placebo effect is, right? <laughs> um, we use that as power, and that helps. Though I think if you revere your doctor too much, you should probably find another doctor because you're not going to question things. Um, I think respect is um, is very different from that, right? And um, um, you do hope that you, I, I sort of hope that my patients mostly respect me, but don't revere me, but also feel empowered enough to question me. Um, um, your other point, which um, I, I really do love, is sort of the, um, you know, the patient's need for power in the relationship. And and I have to say, having not listened to every episode of Econ Talk, but um, but a lot of them, you know, your ability to, I often tell my students, you know, when you learn to drive, um, the my my driving educator told me to aim high in steering, which always sounded like a ridiculous thing, but it was, you know, don't just look very close up, you know, look way into the future, you know, what am I worried about here? Yeah. Um, and it's so important in medical decision making to say, so um, I'm choosing to take this medication, I'm choosing to have this test, you know, sort of what are the long term outcomes of this? Um, what am I going to do with the results of this test? Is it the right test? Is it worth doing at all? Do I actually want to know the results of this? Um, and that's that's critical. And then the last thing, you've talked so much about artificial intelligence, and you know, we are quickly getting to the point um, where probably if a patient is able to present their symptoms, maybe even their signs, sort of physical examination signs in a really reliable way um, that maybe a computer can do as well or better than a doctor at at least outlining a differential diagnosis, right? Here are the three most likely things to think about, and here's the one thing that you know we need to really worry about. Um, but I think the vast majority of people 
would not be satisfied with that, right? Because they're not going to have maybe a little bit of that reverence for the computer that they might for a human being who they're attached to and feel like will carry a little bit more power in the discussion. Um, I mean, it's such an interesting case when it's a diagnostic issue rather than a treatment issue. I mean, they're yes. all interesting, but, but you know, my... Um, I have a friend, he may be listening, he's a doctor, and I, I often turn to him. And my mom turned to him once for a problem she was having, and he diagnosed it correctly. And she she's never gotten over that. She still <laughs> remains in awe of his diagnostic ability. I don't know how special it was that he got that right, one right. right. He did. But I, I'm curious how... For your own internal, and I know you're proud of your diagnostic ability. You write about it. Um, it's a you know it's a combination of of data in and intuition, which is often data driven, not just wild guessing. Yep. How how do you feel about that? How do you when you deliver a diagnosis, the patient doesn't really want you to say, you know, I think this could be right. They yeah. want you to say it's yeah. blank. Yeah. The symptoms they're consistent with, and that's what you got. Yeah. Uh, do you think about that? Um, I think about that a lot. Um, again, to, to 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 talk a little bit about you know the arc of a career and what you gain as you get further in a career and what you lose. Um, you know, one of the things when I see a patient, say in you know our urgent care center um, where I'm working with our trainees, very often we are delivering the same information. We've made the same diagnosis, right? Um, but I am able to say it with such absolute confidence, um, not only in what the diagnosis is, but in what the next steps are and how that person is going to do, right? I can kind of see into the future a little bit. You know, this is what can your outcome yeah. is going to be over the next three to six months. Um, and it's interesting, um, patients, I hate saying patients because it's really people, right? I mean, I've been in this situation, really latch on to that. Um, because again, it's it's a time of uncertainty. It's a time of powerlessness. It's probably a time of anxiety. Um, and to be able to have someone who say, this is what's going on, this is what we're going to do, and this is what's going to happen is so important. Even if the other person standing in the room um, you know, told you the exact same diagnosis but they sort of pitch the plan and the outcome maybe a little bit more honestly because how well do we actually know what the future holds? Um, and I think probably part of what your mom was responding to was it's this and then you're proven right and yeah. you know this person is going to be someone I'm going to trust in the future. That's the Ouija board I'm going to take out again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, no, that's not, not. That's just a cheap shot at humor. <laughs> um, just one other aside, and I want to ask you one last question on this topic. Um, I have a friend who insists on addressing doctors by their first name. So they walk in, they don't say uh, Dr. So-and-so, they say, Adam, good to see you. Because often Adam says, Russ, good to see you. So they right. feel it's important. I'm not sure why. I don't know if this is an ego issue or just a feeling. of. I think it's a dignity issue, yeah. a better word than ego. They want to be on that peer footing. Yeah. That's yeah. That, that level uh, field with the, with the, with the caregiver. Um, do you have patients who do that to you? Uh, what does it make you feel? Do you tell them what to call you? Ah, uh, it's... <laughs> I've thought too much about this. Um, I generally introduce, you know, I I will say to the patient, you know, Mr. Roberts, Dr. Roberts, what would you like to be called? Um, and then I will respond in that same way. Um, I will not tell people what to call me. I'm sort of perfectly happy with them calling me, you know, Dr. Seafew, Adam, whatever they like. If they say Mr. Seafew, I usually say, you know, you can call me anything, call me Adam, call me Dr. Seafew, just don't call me Mr. Seafew. I've worked very hard for that degree. It seems weird for me. Um, and so most of the time when patients come in and say, you know, Adam, how are you? There are people who I've already known and I'm very comfortable with. The people who address me as that right off the bat, um, it does seem like a little bit of a power play to me. Yeah, feels um, Yeah. And I'm sort of fine with it. 
but it gives me some information about the patient, about the person I'm dealing with. And it makes me understand a little bit more about who they are, what they expect from the relationship, how I think they're going to treat me. Um, and so in a way, maybe as the person doing that, it's fine. It's a way of signaling. And um, it probably cuts out a lot of a lot of the time of trying to work to understand who this person is. And the same issue arises with clergy. Uh, I, I think, and I think there's a another side of this we haven't talked about, and it relates to this question of of worship or reverence. Um, some of us don't want a first name relationship with our rabbi, yep. um, imam, priest, minister. We want to look up to them either as role models or as sources of wisdom or counsel, and. Um, I'm not sure I want medical care from Adam. I want medical care from Dr. Seafew. Right. <laughs> and, and if I could call you your highness, I feel <laughs> even better. <laughs> or Emperor Seafew, you know. Uh, anyway. You would uh, be welcome to call me any of those things. <laughs> um, um, it's funny, I've, I've, never, I've never sort of recognized that parallel with clergy. And I would be wildly uncomfortable, certainly, um, you know, when I meet someone, which is often for me in the office, um, I have to call that patient, rabbi, father, whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, it's very interesting. And it, it probably goes to socialization as well. It's how I yeah. was brought up, how I was taught yeah, to respect yeah. these people. Um, and it's the reason that the only reason I can call my doctors by their first name is that, you know, most of them are peers or former trainees. And that's how I think of them. Well, that. My my uh, example of this is when I was a grad student at the University of Chicago, all the faculty members were Mr. Mm. Uh, Mr. Becker, yep. Mr. Lucas, because, of course, they all had PhDs, and the, though they had earned them, it was unnecessary to bestow the honorific on them. And if you go back, if listeners go back to my uh, I think it's in the first year of Econ Talk, 2006, I interviewed Gary Becker, who had been my advisor, and I had spent a lifetime calling him Mr. Becker, uh, as did his, uh, his um, secretary, Myrna Hayeki, by the way, at least when she talked to us. I don't know what she said, sure. what she called him. <laughs> and um, you'll hear me perhaps struggle to call him Gary. Yeah, uh, yeah. It did not, it was, it was a really uncomfortable right. and there's something kind of beautiful about it i don't i don't think it's anything shameful about it i no. think it's kind of cool not at all not at all um this is certainly my mentors along the way um even if they have yelled at me and made them call me by their first name i still think <laughs> of them as professor Wintner or whatever yeah um, so it sticks in your throat yes um well ask question on this you have been a patient, certainly, in your life, and you've gone to doctor's offices. When you're sitting there in that beautiful robe, it's much like a spa, really, usually, <laughs> when you're at a doctor's office. When you're sitting in that flimsy robe or in some state of undress, do you find yourself uh, reflecting on this issue that the person on the other side of that relationship may not be seeing you as a peer or may be and how that affects your ability to share your symptoms and so on. Uh, I do. Interestingly, from me, given my role and now, you know, advancing age, um, I think so much when I'm in that position about how I'm going to make sure that I'm actually being seen as a patient rather than as a doctor. Um, and make sure that I'm, in a way, being treated like everybody else, spoken to like everybody else. And I probably overplay the patient role um, because I have seen so many, you know, let's call them VIPs, um, you know, treated poorly because people are so careful about how they're going to ask questions and and what kind of tests they're going to recommend. And I want to stress so intensely that like, yeah. God, you got to take care of me like you would take care of anybody <laughs> else. Um, maybe maybe an opposite reaction than, than people would expect, but I sort of, I embrace the paper gown, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, definitely a poster or a bumper <laughs> sticker with an exclamation point at the end. Embrace Absolutely. the paper gown. Um, let's... 
uh, shift gears, let's turn to another of your essays, which are uh, four of the things your patients have taught you. Um, you can go through them briefly. I've written them down if you have them on the on your in front of you. But um, you want to give us some highlights from that as in your as you've gotten older. Yeah, the wisdom you've acquired. Yeah, and and, and a lot of these things, I um, you know, when I say it, I feel uh, a little embarrassed because you know maybe they're obvious. Um, I think the one that comes to mind most quickly from that essay is that it's <laughs> it's the patient who's taking the medications, right? Um, and we so often forget as doctors that we think we understand the most important reason that people should be um, having a surgery, taking a medication, accept, ex, accepting a diagnostic test, because we're sort of obsessed with, okay, I'm doing this to get the person better, and this is the obvious thing to do. Um, but it's the person who has to live with the information that they're getting. It's the person who has actually has to take that pill every day, you know, maybe deal with the side effects of that medication every day. And boy, I have just come to appreciate the fact that, you know, an an, an educated, I wouldn't say educated, a well-informed adult, boy, should have all the leeway in the world, right? Um, to accept care, to not accept care, to make what seems from the doctor's perspective an absolutely terrible decision, right? Um, and it seems so obvious, um, but it's so difficult after you've been through medical training um, to to adjust to that, to adapt that, adapt to that, right? You tell a great story in the essay about the older person who's, uh, you recommend, I don't know how old you were at the time, you were young. Yeah, uh, and you. I think it's a dietary um, a re um, recommendation. Is that right? Yes. Is that right? Um, this is actually when I was an intern. I was working at the uh, Dana Farber Cancer Center. Um, we had um, multiple people, you know, at really the end of their lives on very complicated, novel cancer therapies. Um, and this woman came in, you know even if she did perfectly last six months of her life. Um, besides her cancer, she also had pretty severe um, uh, cardiac disease. And I wrote her for like a, you know, low salt, low cholesterol cardiac diet. Um, and the patient actually had the nurse page me to the bedside so, so she could berate me. Um, and she began her, her, her talk to me saying like, I'm told that you wrote me for this diet you can only possibly be an optimist or an idiot. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh. and, and obviously I'm telling this story, this must have been 1993 or 94, you know, 30 years later. And it stuck with me so well, and I can still picture her. And, you know, she's sort of a mentor to some extent, right? She, she taught me a lesson there, um, which is well-remembered. Well, we'll finish the, you've, You've forgotten. I read it more recently than you have. Yeah. You said an optimist. Or, she said, you're either an optimist or a moron. And then she said something like, I'm going to die soon. So it's only a question of whether I'm going to be unhappy. Right. So can't you at least right. let me eat some food that I like? I mean, it's, right. a, it's a great story. Right. right. Absolutely. I changed her diet immediately, I have to say. <laughs> I think I might have brought her a cookie at some time during that admission as well. Yeah. Um, salted caramel, I'm sure. Right. Um, what else? We, we've got... Uh, very interesting wording. You say diagnostic tests give you more than just a diagnosis. What what does that mean? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we do a diagnostic test, um, right, we are looking to say, you know, do you have coronary disease? Do you have a urinary tract infection? Um, but what's interesting is that very often um, those diagnostic tests one change people change people's lives. Right? We're very fond of saying that they take um, people and turn them into patients. Right? Um, sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes, especially in the case of screening tests, that's not necessary. Maybe you're turning people into a patient in a way that's not going to benefit them at all. Um, the other thing is that um, doing a diagnostic test, especially with 21st century medicine, generally unleashes, you know, an entire string of decisions and possibilities and interventions. Um, and, 
you just have to be so careful at the very beginning of that string. Um, do you want to go down this path? Um, and I think most of us think that, oh, you know, what's wrong with a little bit of information? You know, knowledge is power. Um, but sometimes in retrospect, you, you, me as the doctor, my patient feels like, ah, you know, maybe if we'd never known this, um, instead of, you know, living for two years, 18 months of those two years, knowing that I had cancer, would I have been better off living for two years, but only knowing I had cancer for the last six months of it? Um, and I'm not sure, well, I should say, I know I don't have the right answer most of the time, um, but very often I just like to pause before, you know, that before placing that order, have the conversation with the patient, say, look, these are next steps. These are possible outcomes. Do you want to really start this? Yeah, and I'm going to say something now. I don't, I want listeners to be careful. I don't, I think it's, it's risky advice or it's not advice. It's just a risky observation. that's somewhat, somewhat um, dangerous. I, I, I've written that oftentimes we delay decisions because we just don't want to make a decision and we yeah. claim that we're waiting to get more information and when in fact we just don't want to make a decision and there's actually no information forthcoming that would make the decision any better it just i'd rather postpone it right and it seems to me sometimes in medical care this issue you're talking about of uh once you get on this um conveyor belt you're going to be put through a series of further tests, further diagnostics and interventions that sometimes it's worth uh, waiting to see if that situation is stable or not. Um, what's the speed of growth? And of course, often we, we're just so horrified by that, that we have something that we don't want to wait. I, I, you know, that, that's also very wise and, and very human, but I just know times in my life, whether either it's fear of the diagnosis or uh, an awareness that not all diagnostics are free, uh, even if they're financially not, yeah. nothing out of yeah. pocket, that there are times that you don't, it's better to wait. Do, do you think about that? It seems to me it's an interesting challenge for us, certainly as potential patients. Yeah. It's, it can kill you. Uh, so it's not, that's why I say very, yeah. I say it with some trepidation. I'm not suggesting that you should always wait. That's, that would be really not smart. But um, sometimes it, it is better to keep something under observation and learn something about it sometimes. I, I think it is worth asking the question because as you say, sometimes, right, a diagnosis can be life or death. And, and it's worth asking the question, you know, how necessary is it that I need to make a decision now? How long would you feel comfortable waiting? Um, as soon as you started talking about it, although I, I very much um, identify, you know, as a medical conservative with, boy, a lot of the things we take care of just get better on their own. And right. probably waiting is the best medicine. Um, there are so many people who I've taken care of over the years who postpone decisions for so long. And I can hear myself at so many visits saying, um, you have made the decision not to embark on this workup, right? You've made that decision by postponing the decision. Um, and for me, as someone with limited time with patients, um, I mostly have to tell them, I am considering this decision made because you've postponed making a decision for six months. I assume you're never going to do anything about this. Please bring this up to me again if you change your mind. Um, because at some point as a doctor, I'm like, I can't wait any longer for this person. But I think that's really important advice. I mean, that's to, to make someone aware of the, that they've implicitly right. made that, that choice uh, and forcing them to confront it is I think incredibly helpful. Most doctors just say, go get this tested, go get this test. And um, it's not their test. They send right. you somewhere else. Right. And there are many of those I never did. And yeah. I've been lucky, maybe I'm stupid, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It was foolish, but f reminding me that, that that's in my nature is a good thing because right. that's dangerous. Well, I think your point is 
also, and it's probably something I, I've, I'm now coming out of this recording, both with a new essay topic, but also with a new tool to use with patients, is that you know, I think that delaying a test until you have more information is an intelligent thing to do. And that more information may be that I'm doing more research, I'm waiting for some study to be completed, or I'm waiting to see how my symptoms progress over the next three months. Um, if you are delaying a test um, for more information, which will not be coming, um, then you've made a decision not to have that test. And that probably just needs to be articulated. Yeah. yeah. Uh the other lessons you talk about, anything you want to say there about, um, uh, there are two ways to care for patients um, with ambiguous illnesses go poor, goes poorly and one way it goes well. What's that about? Yeah. So ambiguous illnesses um, are uh, something which has gone by a lot of names over the years. Um, uh, symptoms of unknown origin is another one, which I love. Um, our, our, our patients who are clearly suffering you know, from something but that we in medicine haven't been able to, you know, reduce it to our sort of 21st century pathophysiologic rubrics. Um, and so not only do we not understand them well, we generally do not have good treatments for them. And, you know, I think probably what we're talking about most now is long COVID, that, you know, even the people who study this the most don't understand it that well um, and even have trouble defining it. Um, and um, seeing patients who have these ambiguous, ambiguous illnesses can be very frustrating, um, both for doctor and patient. Um, and what I tried to articulate in this essay was that um, I have seen these visits go well, um, or these relationships around an illness go well. And that's usually when a Doctor can be honest and say, we don't understand this, but I am committed to working working with you on this. Um, I am happy to entertain suggestions for you. I'm happy for you to seek care that I feel like is is safe and not something which will um, which will steal your money, you know, outside of traditional medicine. And where a patient is willing to sort of almost buy into that uncertainty, accept that uncertainty, work with the physician, you know, to, to try to get better. Um, often those relationships go very poorly, um, either because the doctor just gives up, you know, is so frustrated that I can't take care of this the way I can take care of hypertension or diabetes or breast cancer. Um, and feels like they have nothing to offer the patient. And even if they don't say, I have nothing to offer you, the patient understands very quickly that this doctor has given up on me. Um, sometimes, although we hate to say this, you know, sometimes it's the patient's fault because the doctor has sort of done what's right and says, we don't understand this. No further evaluation is going to lead us to a diagnosis. I'm not going to be able to prescribe a silver bullet for you, but I will work with you. And, you know, that's honest. Um, that person is committed to helping the symptoms. Um, but the patient at that point in time is kind of unwilling to accept that um, and will continue to change doctors, will constantly, sh you know, shop for that diagnosis, which will be the answer, um, even if all evidence says that that won't exist. Um, and those people often put themselves at great risk um, because there's nothing we're better at medicine than spending lots and lots of money doing lots and lots of tests. And many of those are invasive, many of those are dangerous, and some of those turn up information um, that leads to treatments of other problems which aren't important. That comes back to partly to what we said earlier too. We have such respect, I think, for modern medicine uh, you're in the kitchen. You know, I have a. <laughs> I had a friend who who worked in the pharmaceutical business who said he never took medicine. I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "I work for a pharmaceutical company," <laughs> <laughs> and he was serious. Uh, I don't think he literally meant he'd never take yeah, medicine, yeah. but he 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 had an inherent skepticism of the reliability of certain treatment. But for most of us, that's just not an entertainable hypothesis, yeah. and we expect uh, you to. I've used this image on the program before, you know, you lift up the hood of the car 
and there's a switch that should be on on and it's off. Oh, I found the problem. It, 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 that is what we expect of our doctors. We often get it. Yeah. And uh, it's wonderful. So when it can't be done or isn't easily done, it's uh, the cognitive dissonance there is very um, disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of downstream risks to our successes in in, yeah. in the 21st century. Um, it's certainly true. I, I want to go to my favorite essay uh, of the ones I read recently. You shared with me when we were prepping for this, which is called, um, it's about your memory binder. Uh, uh, what What is your memory binder? So my memory binder is, um, uh, is truly a binder. I have it behind me in my office here, um, which has um, the, the face sheet, the snapshot, as we call it, um, for every patient who I've ever taken care of who's died. Um, um, not people I've known for you know three days in the hospital, but people who I've cared for in my outpatient practice um, who've passed away. Um, I certainly did not plan to keep this. Um, I began keeping it because my very first patient who died when I was an attending physician, um, you know, I was pretty broken up. It was a very difficult um, end for a very young woman, and um, as I sort of pulled her face sheet out of my file. I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? And the idea of just throwing it in the garbage, you know, was literally painful. Um, so I stuck it in a drawer and that kind of became a habit for me of what I would do with those. Um, and then when my office got moved a few years into my practice and I opened up this drawer and I was like, what do I do with these? Um, and so I, you know, just put holes in them and put them in a binder and I've continued that. Um, and it's turned into this sort of amazing thing for me um, because it reminds me of people who I was close to, even if it was for a brief amount of time, um, often, you know, very intense periods, um, certainly in their life, but often in mine. Um, the diseases that are represented in there have evolved over time. My patient panel has evolved so much over time, where at the beginning, these were patients who I knew very briefly, and there's usually just a sheet. As time's gone on, very often, um, you know, families send me remembrances, or I take things from their funerals, which I attach on there. Um, now, given, you know, where I work and what my patient panel looks like, you know, I have three page obituaries which go along with those, um, which I staple on. And and I can't say, you know, it would be very morbid for me to say, oh, I look at this every week. Um, but there are occasional times when someone passes and I I put their sheet in there that I take towards um kind of thumbing through it. And um and interestingly, the memories are usually good rather than painful because what's lost is sort of the disease state. Um and what remains is is kind of an image of just these people, these these patients of mine, which is kind of wonderful to be reminded of them. And to be clear, these are not people who died because of your mistakes. <laughs> they, although there are such um, right. people who collect those, right. uh, these are just people who, in the course of life, uh, either at the end of an illness that was not curable, or just from I assume other causes, uh, unrelated to your to medical treatment, sure. just didn't. Right. They're no longer with us. You also mentioned that some people keep binders if they're um, OBGYNs of babies they've delivered. And so you write about yours. Within the binder is a single page for every one of my patients who has died. The collection is not a place of bitterness and regret, nor is each entry associated with the joy of a new life. Instead, it is a place I visit to pay my respects, to learn, to reminisce, and to trace the arc of my career. So I think that's very beautiful. I want to go back to that first page, though, because it just struck me as um, very interesting. I, there are people who are hoarders who have trouble throwing things out. I don't know. I don't know if you're one of those. Um, but this strikes me: the face sheet, the keeping, the finding yourself having a, a very somewhat sterile summary of a human being, holding it in your hand after that person has passed away. And feeling uncomfortable throwing it out. 
is really a, a beautiful thing. It reminds me of, you know, in the Jewish tradition, if you have a holy document, whether it's a piece of a Torah scroll or anything that was used for ritual purposes, often you're not allowed, according to Jewish law, to throw it away. And in fact, you have to bury it the way you would a human being because there is something divine about that writing, uh, which is a very, I think, powerful idea. On the surface, it's kind of might strike some people as kind of silly, but it forces you over time to revere, to come back to where we used before, okay. uh, language um, and holy language in particular, and things used in ritual and so on. And it's obvious to me that you saw that somewhat sterile piece of paper to have some transcendence to it and that it would be unseemly to treat it the way you would a, a receipt or an invoice that was inside a package, which is what we usually do when we throw a piece of paper away. And it didn't belong with those kinds of pieces of paper. Uh, so that's really extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, uh, that is that is true. It is wonderfully stated. It, it probably gives more thoughtfulness, um, <laughs> um, you know, to the action at the time. I think as you talked about it, and I think of the individual patient, um, this was someone at the very start of my career. And reflecting on it now, her outcome would have been the same no matter what I had done. Um, but I certainly would have taken care of her differently now, you know, 30 years in than I would have at the time. And I think I recognized that I wasn't perfect in the way I cared for her. Um, and because there was a little bit of, you know, let's call it guilt at the time, um, that was another reason that I couldn't just toss this away. I wanted to be reminded of it. Um, Roughly how many entries are in that binder? How many people? Yeah, so uh, I, it's hard, hard to ask a doctor to admit this, right? Um, um, I've been, I graduated from medical school in 1993. Um, I've had my own practice here since 1997. So um, 27 years as a general internist. Uh, when I picked up my practice, most people, you know, were in their 50s and 60s. And by the wonders of math, you know, those people are mostly in their 80s and 90s now. Um, so we're talking a few hundred patients um, at this point. Um, I went back and added... Um, the one man who I took care of as a resident um, in my resident practice who died um, just sort of wrote his name on a piece of paper and stuck it in the back because I felt like he, you know, he was an important person to me as the first person I lost. Um, why do you think you do this? I understand why you might have been uneasy throwing that away. Yeah. But obviously this is more than just respect yeah. for a, a memento. Yeah. There's something else going on there. Yeah, I think that the two things, um, one is personal and one is professional. Um, I do think to some extent um, it is medically interesting. Um, I can look back through this and I can see, you know, why people died. Um, and it really is amazingly interesting that at the beginning of my career, there was a lot of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, HIV, um, heart disease, um, cancers. As my practice has progressed and as medicine has progressed, more and more people um, just die of old age, you know, die after falls um, because medicine has gotten so much better that a lot of those things that people used to die of, people don't die of anymore if they're receiving you know, good regular medical care, and and that's that's important. Um, the other thing is, you know, as physicians, and I think patients often don't realize this. Um, you know, I become quite attached to a lot of my patients. They're, they're not my friends, um, but I am very interested in them. I am very fond of them, um, and when I'm not seeing them anymore, when all of a sudden they disappear from my schedule, you know whether it be every couple of weeks, often at the end of somebody's life or every few months, you know, while they're old and sick or maybe every year or two when they're young and healthy, um, they sort of leave a hole. Um, and 
when a family member dies, right, um, we can memorialize that person, whether it's going to a graveyard or whether it's just sitting around at a family dinner and telling stories about someone, right? That person lives on. Um, for doctors with patients, that doesn't happen. Those people just truly disappear. Um, and this is really a way for me to memorialize people who often I was fond of, um, uh, even the people who I'm not fond of, maybe to go back to our the beginning of this conversation, um, they played a big part in my life. You know, um, often in the last weeks of people's lives, especially when you're caring for them in hospice or or they're very sick and you're trying desperately to keep that person around for a little longer. You know, I'll wake up at four o'clock in the morning, you know, thinking about like, ah, we should do this. This is a good idea. Um, um, and there seems like there should be a way to think about that as you go forward. I never thought about it. You know, I have friends here at work. I have friends for my community activity, whether it's religious or hobbies or other things. I have my family. Um, you don't spend so much time with your colleagues. I mean, you do. They're, they're colleagues you you interact with daily, but right. most of your daily interactions are patients. So at least a third of your life, maybe more, right. are these people. And right. it's it would be unseemly to take a picture of them before they <laughs> uh, passed away or just or any of your patients so generally. But for our friends and family who we love, whether they're alive or not, we often look at pictures of them as a way of remembering how they played a role in our life, that time in our life. And obviously, this is a way that you can do it. I don't, do you know of any other doctors who do this? Um, there are a couple of my colleagues who do this. I'll say do this now, <laughs> you know, yeah. because of me talking to them about yeah. them. But as you say, there are people um, in medicine who, who, carry other lists. Um, many uh, obstetricians keep a list of, you know, every child they've delivered over the years. Um, there are, I also have a list, fortunately, a much smaller um, little journal of kind of errors that I've made um, that I keep track of that I do go back somewhat frequently to. Um, and um you know, Henry Marsh um, wrote an amazing book a few years ago called Do No Harm, where he really spent an entire book, um, each chapter going in um, in quite detail to patients who he feels like he harmed during his career, um, you know, always setting out to do the best, um, but where the outcomes were poor. Um, and, you know, the honesty of that book, which is essentially a list turned into a nonfiction memoir, um, is spectacular and, and yeah. really uh, resonates with me. You write that you worry that your colleagues might find it morbid. I think it is morbid. <laughs> yes. um, do, do most of them know about it? Do any of them ever, or you say a couple have copied you, do any of right. them look at you askance for doing this? I'm sure they do, but they don't tell me. Um, nice. I, I think having written <laughs> having written about this, um, um, I think they all know. Um, to, to circle back to what you said about colleagues, I, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, of the colleagues who we work with, um, you think of the conversations you have with your colleagues, and 95% of them, they are very much, how are the kids? What'd you do over the weekend? You know, do you have any travel planned? Um, and you think of the conversations you have with your patients, which are so much deeper um, than they are with people who you've worked with for, for decades. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're a pretty sensitive person. Uh, you might be faking it. Uh, your essays <laughs> reveal a certain sensitivity to my ear and I, uh, and you you just mentioned something in passing that you keep a book of your mistakes and review it from time to time. Many people, I don't know about most doctors, but many people prefer not to think about those. They're, they're not interested in learning from them. Uh, they'd rather repress those memories. I'm curious what made you who you are to the extent that you have a feeling for it. Is it something you think you have from your parents, uh, books you read, role models you found? It's a slightly awkward question. I apologize for it. But, but I think it's, um, it's your essays reflect 
a level of care that I think all of us would want to receive from from a doctor and don't always feel that we do. So um, I salute you for that. And I'm curious if you yeah. know the source of your devotion I to, appreciate, to your craft. I appreciate that. They're very kind words. I could say that I didn't come on Econ Talk to be psychoanalyzed, so I'm going to refuse to answer the question. Um, we can no, cut it, too, my, if you want. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, my interestingly, my father um, was an adolescent psychoanalyst, um, a job which I think you could only do in 1980s Manhattan. Um, and I always said to some extent it was impossible because it, as a teenager, he always knew what I was thinking more <laughs> than I was thinking, which just sort of pissed me off. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand... Um, he was always uh, sort of a step ahead about thinking about things and I think pushed me to do it. Um, and so I think I do owe a lot to him. Um, I also, although I'm not going to say I'm a fraud, um, it's always a little bit hard having these conversations because, right, this is these kind of things are always a small part of of ourselves. Um, and I don't want it to make it seem like I'm always walking around sort of navel gazing, thinking about my practice in 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 great depth. Um, but I do think that you know medicine is is such a rich field um as far as the the human interaction part of it, um, um, that I do my I do find myself having to think about that almost um, as part of doing a good job and keeping myself sane. Um, and, you know, I like to figure out a way of processing that. Some some of it is conversations with family and colleagues and friends. And some of it for me, you know, are these kind of written reflections. Um, because as anybody who does any writing knows, right, you have these ideas, which when you're walking to work, you think like, wow, that's profound. <laughs> and then you write it down and 90% of the time you're like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever written. <laughs> and sometimes you're like, huh, you know, there's something to this and it's helpful to kind of work it out on a piece of paper and figure out what actually works and what doesn't. My guest today has been Adam Seafew. Adam, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.